Hey guys, it's Jasper, and I have just finally finished this big book of literary criticism. Yay! So overall, I'm very happy with the book. I'm happy I read it, happy I took my notes on it. Lots of really great leads uh, for research from this book. The book is full of great resources. Table of contents, really, really, like this sounds maybe like a weird thing to say, like I really liked the table of contents, but it was nice because sometimes the titles don't necessarily tell you what that chapter is really gonna hold. And in the case of this book, not only do they have uh, the title, but they also have subtitles within, which aren't just in the chapters themselves, Hopefully you can see that, but um, not just in the chapters themselves, but are also in the table of contents. So it's a book that is really, really easy to use, and it's one that if you didn't want to have to read the whole thing, but you're doing research in this area, you could certainly use the table of contents to find, okay, where do I need to read or where do I need to focus? On that same note, they have um, an excellent appendix lots of really great sources with their uh, bibliography. It's, this is a work that really is striving to connect to the academic community around them and add something to the conversation, but also help you to plug in. They begin the introduction in such a lovely way and the introduction just pulls you in. So I want to share with you just a little bit. The world is full of spirits, as thick as atoms in the air, wrote Robert Kirk in 1691. They populate every nook and cranny. They are non-entities or phantoms or creatures proceeding from an, a frightened apprehension, confused or crazed sense, but realities. Not all tales of pygmies, fairies, nymphs, sirens, or apparitions can be true, but so many are the stories and so universally told that surely they could not spring of nothing. And my heart goes, ah, I love that. Um, and, and the authors are very conscious and, and throughout the book, they play with this idea that the fairy world, it's almost like, well, for sure it's not fairies, but there's not, not fairies, right? Um, and it's, they play with this weird sort of in-between world and it's really, it's really lovely and I like that in their criticism they don't have to be saying these are concrete facts, these are concrete truths. They just go, well this sounds kind of crazy but look at all of these people who reacted so strongly because they believed that these things were true. And isn't that interesting how people felt so strongly that these things were true and why did they feel that way and you know what were the positives of that feeling, what were the negatives of that feeling and all that good stuff. After the introduction, the first three chapters bring you through the world of the fairy. And again, as somebody who's already read quite a bit in the field, I think I had, I had going into it already an illustration of this world. So I was like, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, we know these things. But if you haven't read that much about uh, Celtic fairy, tales and folklore, then these first three chapters will be really valuable for you. Uh, so I, I have to just read something else to you again. James Hogg says that fairies were was not disputed, but what they were was greatly doubted. Each argument was guarded well with if and should and who can tell? My heart. Now after the lovely first three chapters, you get into a less comfortable read in the fourth chapter. And the fourth chapter is called The Rise of the Demonic. What this chapter addresses is how it is or when it was that fairy belief soured in the public view and when it led into the witch hunts. You know, obviously that's something that makes it a difficult read. Um, one of the things that made it difficult was that the chapter names the names of witches. Um, or people, sorry, people that were accused of being witches. And they actually give 
um, extra notes on a list of the names of witches, and they used the testimony in the text. There's quotes from people who were saying, yes, I'm a witch, and this is what I did, and um, it was really difficult to read this testimony, to hear it, and, um, you know, just to be sitting comfortably, you know, cozied up on my couch with a cup of coffee, or sitting outside and enjoying the sunshine, and reading the testimony of people who died, and died in, like, really awful, awful ways, and it just breaks your heart. Henderson and Cohen, they do a good job of remembering that they're talking about people and being emotional and respectful and, and they do a great job of capturing that and probably biting their tongue a little bit when they're talking about things to not get too too nasty because remembering that the, the people who who committed the trials were people too and in some cases, in, like, well, in all cases, incredibly misguided, but in some cases, people who were trying to do something good and did something so horrible. And it's just, it's just, it's one of those things. It's hard, um, it, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to keep in mind. They start chapter four, The Rise of the Demonic, with a quote from Sir Walter Scott, who talks about sort of what I'm talking about now. At least I think so. Maybe I'm misguided. The Reformation swept away many of the corruptions of the Church of Rome, but the purifying torrent remained itself somewhat tinctured by the superstitious impurities of the soil over which it passed. The trials of sorcerers and witches, which disgrace our criminal records, become even more frequent after the Reformation of the Church as if human credulity, no longer amused by the miracles of Rome, had sought for food in the traditionary records of popular superstition. One of the things they talked about is that mixed in with the witch hunts, which were, um, you know, initiated largely by the church, who was responding to the question of the people when they're going, you know, why have we been having these plagues? Why have we been having wars? And the church said, you know, you have, um, there's sin in your community, right? Um, you need to take those people out of the community. Um, and this became, you know, developed into, into witchcraft, that there's witches in your community, there's people who are uh, serving the devil in your community. And, to put, it, to put it lightly, but that all of the things associated with witchcraft were associated with Celtic folklore. Um, and they talked about how not just there being bans on witches who were often, um, especially in Scotland, witches were people who were healers and would publicize, like, yes, for sure, I'm a witch, come by if you have a cough. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, but that, there was, so there was an association, you know, for sure, there's a proclamation, I'm a witch, this is what I do, like, I'm a doctor, or I'm a dentist, or whatever, come by my office, I can help you out. But during this time, certain bans being put on witches, being bans on people who are going to see the witches, um, and along with that, there was a ban on things that had to do with, um, any sort of pagan ritual, and so certain songs were taken right out, were banned, or the songs were taken away and then changed. Henderson and Cohen say the legislation targeted those who were regarded as the custodians of the folk tradition. To eradicate the bearers was to eradicate the lore. The fifth chapter, yes, the fifth chapter then moves sort of backwards forwards looking at stories about the fairies that were foundational for fairy tales and folklore and that's a little bit of fun because you get some stories from Thomas Reimer who is supposed to be sort of a prophet figure and you know claimed to have all these different experiences with the fairies and so that chapter's you know just just a good good bout of fun and it talks about how um you know, different authorities, sometimes the, you know, the king in place or, you know, whoever it was, how they would use the folklore to sort of their advantage and find ways to try to write themselves into the fifth and make themselves important, elevate themselves through a connection with the fairy, the fairies, which is kind of funny. Sixth chapter, the sixth chapter, the sixth chapter, then goes into 
the revitalization of the fairy tales. So after this periods of trials with the witch hunts, um, with banning certain ballads and all of that kind of stuff, they go and the chapter is called The Reinstatement of Fairy Belief. A book that I need to read next is Robert Kirk's The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns, and Fairies. The sixth chapter actually focuses on the work of Robert Kirk and as the importance of the secret of the Commonwealth to folklorists and historians alike cannot be overestimated. This treatise provides a first-hand account of the belief in fairies and second sight in the area of Pershire where Kirk lived and worked. He was, of course, not alone in his desire to preserve for posterity or any other reason the belief and traditions of his countrymen and women. So the sixth focuses on Robert Kirk, who was somebody who was um, out to prove that the fairy belief was real and he was somebody who I'm pretty sure he was a minister and so for him it was showing how Christianity and the fairy belief did not conflict obviously as it would have been seen as conflicting um, during the trials and during the bans of the ballads and all of that kind of stuff and so he was trying to bring in and say these two things can go alongside each other and, and that's sort of interesting so the seventh chapter ends in a very beautiful way because it carries forward the work that the previous two chapters were doing, you know, with setting the bar of the place that fairy belief has within the community and gives you a long list of people that you can, it's sort of just synopsis of their work, sort of. People like James Hogg, Hugh Miller, George MacDonald, who I love, Princess and the Goblin. Catherine Sinclair, uh, Dina Craig, Eleanor Boyle, William Sharp, uh, George Fraser, G.M. Barry, all of these authors who work to say there's something important and there's something of value in this folklore and preserving this tradition. So all in all, what I can say about this book is bravo. Yay! It is well organized. You don't necessarily have to read the whole thing. You can go through the chapters and or through the appendix and find what it is you're looking for. It's easy to access. It's also a great bridge. It's a great introduction, I'm sorry, to the subject. And then it's a great bridge to other authors and other works that you can be looking into. And I know for me, that's one of the things that I really, really liked the best about this is that it's introduced me to more work that I need to do. And then the last thing that I really liked about this book was uh, Lizanne Henderson and Edward J. Cohen's approach with the text and with the subject. They're talking about people and they they treated people like people and it was wonderful. They humanized the subject and I think that's something very valuable. Ta-da! I have to tell you that I did something today. Something that I am not ashamed of but but uh, I did it with hesitation, is that I got these books because I had to. Um, I always have a bathtub book and I had finished Outlander, the first book, and I really, 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 really wanted to get the second one, but I was like, man, I have this huge shelf of books that I need to read. But then I went to chapters it was only like $12, and so I bought the next Diana Gabaldon book, Dragonfly and Ember. My theory was that I'm so behind. Everybody's already read through the whole series, or at least is like into the third or... Sorry guys, I got interrupted by my camera who was telling me that I had talked too much and there was no more room in the world for all the things I had to say about Outlander and fairies, apparently. So I know that I said... And maybe I didn't say it out loud, but I've certainly said it enough times out loud to the people around me, the people I love, that I need to not buy any more books, but I just had to. And I think that if you're an Outlander fan, you will agree that this is what I had to do, and I should have done it a long time ago because I'm way behind, so I'm excited. And I also bought Stardust by Neil Gaiman. This has been on my reading list for a really really long time. I'm really excited about it. So I was in chapters, I saw these books, this was the gateway, and then I was like, well if I'm gonna buy this book, I might as well buy this book too. Because that's how it works, right? If I'm gonna break it to buy one book, I should buy at least more than one. But I didn't buy 
three or more because I almost did that as well. And I was like, no, Jasper, because these are for good behavior. I just recently finished two books of criticism, the one I reviewed today, another one that I haven't reviewed because I just finished it as I was starting this YouTube channel. I finished two books of criticism, and so I just felt like a two for two, finished two books so I could add two lists to my TBR, and then it'll never be done. I don't know. Book logic, da-da-da-da.